Um, thanks everyone for coming. Um, I suppose uh, what I've tried to tackle over the last few months and the next few months is, is a bit of a goodbye from Argyle story. Um, for those who have been familiar with Argyle, you would have seen a great flurry of information in the 80s and basically went hiatus in the 90s and 2000s. To be honest, it's a bit of an embarrassment. So we, this story is a little bit about not just what Argyle is, but there was a few issues at the moment, which we won't discuss um, fully, but it really led to, was the geology correct? And from that, uh, we published quite a number of papers, myself and quite a few of the, the authors. And now that we've closed off, I really want to start to share this around and, and spread the love around the places. For those who haven't recognised, there's quite a few samples over there under the lights. Um, there's some the highest grade samples in the world, basically, sitting under the lights. And there's some few pretties over there as well. So um, go and have a look at that afterwards and ask some questions if you want. But today it's really going to be talking about, for those um, for those who know a lot about diamonds, excuse me, but I'm just going to go back to basics for a few slides and explain why we look for diamonds, where they are, what it means. And then we're going to go into the, into the Argyle story. <clears throat> I'm purposely not going to go onto, my, onto the presentation here because I'm going to be flipping between lots of photos, lots of videos and all the pretty stuff and not too much on the, on the uh, words. So you've got to go back to basics with respect to where the diamonds form and really it comes down to cradle formation. So if we are sitting back in the Archean, you've got to remember that's the period of time in the earth where we're getting thick crustal with the sphere forming. If you want to go and understand that, there's some great talks by us. I remember David Groves last year talking about cratons and craton preservation for orogenic gold. In fact, most deposits around the world, if you've got a thick craton and the deposit forms around or inside that craton and it's survived over four plus billion years, that's where you're looking for it. And the kimberlites or lamprites are no different. Um, basically, if you're sitting in the earth and looking up, so let's say we're in the mantle looking up at the earth now, this would represent a craton, a cratonic keel sitting under there. So now, at the moment, we might only have, say, 50 kilometres thickness of lithospheric crust, and maybe the mid ocean ridge is maybe 25. Back then, we would get 150 to 250 kilometres of thickness. So, if we're underneath the earth and we're in the mantle, all this red stuff sitting out here and it's cooking hot, we're sitting at about 1600 degrees. So, that's too hot for a diamond to form. So, where do we look? Well, at the keel, the base of these cratons, it's about 1200 degrees. That's pretty cool, geologically speaking. And therefore, that's a beautiful, what we call a diamond window where diamonds can form. So we're looking at the base of these cratons. If you look at something like South Africa, um, or Africa, I should say, <clears throat> basically that's really a series of cratons which have bashed into each other after plate tectonics start. They're welded into each other and they haven't split apart since that point. That's why there's so many diamonds in Africa. There's diamonds in other places around the world. We'll discuss that a bit later as well. The great thing about diamonds, if you're a jeweller, you would hate this because it's full of inclusions and glitzes or feathers or cracks, whatever you want to call them. But basically, there's a flaw in that diamond. For us geologists, these little flaws are picking up pieces of the mantle and actually telling us information about how the diamonds form. So this is going to be the only scientific graph you're going to see today. Um, but basically, it's saying at 1400 degrees, you're not going to be able to form diamonds. So we can form diamonds in the window here. And we want it in a Goldilocks zone. We don't want it too hot, otherwise they're going to reabsorb into the magma. And we can't have it too cool, but it's not really the cool part of it. It's really the coolness due to the pressure. So it's got to be formed at depth under pressure, and therefore it's going to have a high temperature, but it can't be too high. So if we're looking in here, then where this is an exaggeration of the cratonic keels, let's say that's the cratonic keel in here, then if we have a magma pulse coming up on the outside and it doesn't actually erupt, that's just a magma that will not pick up diamonds, hasn't even erupted as a volcano. We're really talking about volcanoes here. That's all we're talking about. If we're looking at this situation whereby a pulse of magma comes up, it's missed the diamond formation zone, it's hit the surface, it's erupted, but it's a boring old volcano, but it hasn't got the potential to get any diamonds. This one here, if that magma actually came up below the diamond zone, and if it actually picked up diamonds and it went through the zone, if there was actually diamond in that diamond zone, it doesn't have to be is because it's sitting in the right position. And if those diamonds actually made it up, and if the diamonds didn't stop halfway up and got reabsorbed by the magma because it's too hot and the diamonds would disappear, and it got to the surface and it erupted, and if that eruption actually poured out the diamonds, and if that volcano didn't get weathered away over millions of years, 
and if that diamond, that diamond if it's volcano didn't get buried and you can't find the damn thing, then you may have a diamond if it's volcano. Now, one in a hundred of those that you find becomes an economic deposit. So when we say diamonds are rare, that's actually why. Okay, so it's very difficult to go and find them. And often these things are 50 metres in diameter, 100 metres in diameter. Argyle is a biggie, which we'll have a look at as it goes on. This is a classic De Beers piece of art, uh, for want of a better word. <laughs> but they actually got artists to work with the geologists and they made these fantastic sections, which are a little bit interpretive. But the reality is that's the protonic keeling here. And if you look at all the purple bits, think of that as perinatite. Okay, this is almost not primary mantle, but basically this is where you get kimberlite stock forming. There's many, as with geology everywhere in the world, for every single deposit, for every single commodity, there's contentious issues. However, probably the best analogy and the best agreement they've got at the moment is that if you take that purple perinatite stuff, metasomatize it a little bit, in other words, you've got some volatiles, you cook it up a little bit, it probably turns into equidite. So in most deposits, you're going to get equidetic diamonds and peridotitic diamonds. Same stock originally, but there's probably modification from some of this material. So this unit here may come up, pick up some peridotitic diamonds, pick up some equidetic diamonds, more peridotitic diamonds, and potentially deposit at the surface. Argyle, which I'm not going to go too much into, but you, someone's going to ask a question at the end about pink diamonds. <laughs> And I'm going to point you back to this part in here. Argyll is an enigma. Argyll should not have been found where it is. It should not have been discovered at all, actually, um, because the, the model at the time, and here's a lesson that every single one of your exploration geologists knows, that the model at the time says you need to be in this part of the craton. Don't worry about this side stuff. That's rubbish. And Argyll basically formed at the edge of a subduction zone, if you want to think of it like that, not a genetic belt. It was pretty mobile zone. So that wasn't in the model. It wasn't expected to be there. But the fact that we're probably close to here, we've probably got more eclectic diamonds. And the fact there's probably more grief, temperature, pressure, and subduction around there potentially has a bit of a story to play for the Argyle, particularly the pinks. Where are they located around the world? So we can be seismic around the world. And remember, I told you back in the Arctic, there's 150 to 200 kilometers, 250 kilometers thickness of Praton. So that's going to be the solid, big, thick, chunky concrete like material surrounded by a lot of weaker stuff. So with side mix, you can pick that material up. So where does that tell you you are around the world? Africa is obvious. We've got lots of diamonds in Africa. South America has a good history. Um, we're in the Great Slave Craton and Ngava Craton sitting up here in Canada. So we have diamond deposits sitting up here. There's numerous deposits up here, Gaucho Place, that lake, Victor, et cetera. We had the Siberian Craton in uh, Russia, Carillion Craton, Craton and Archangel in Finland, and so on. And India is, a, is, a, is an old source. Today, we're going to be talking about this little beast. It's the Kimberley Craton. So at about 1.8 billion years ago, the Kimberley Craton belted into the North Australian Craton. And it basically hasn't left ever since. So the suture zones, the orogenic zones, the mobile zones, the destructive train smashes are basically the Hall Street mobile zone and the King Leopold mobile zone. Okay, so they're the sidewall smashes that this is belted into. Argyle erupted at 1.2 billion years. Allendale's erupting around 20 million years. So it doesn't mean it has to be the same. It just means when things open and close, then most likely things are coming up. In this case, a lamprite deposit, a lamprite material. Let's go and have a look at where it's located. So Australia, sitting here, obviously we're down in here in Perth. And the easiest way to go and find Argyle is go and find Lake Argyle, okay? So that's a person-made project in, open in the 73, 74. So they are developing this in one of those snowy mountain scheme type deposit things around Australia. And the Argyle Dam really was to try and irrigate the north of Australia and then sell that to cotton slash vegetables slash whatever, potentially to Asia and around the world. So if you come to the base of Lake Argyle, then on what we call the Matsu Range surrounding here, that's the Argyle Diamond Mine, okay? So Argyle's sitting off here. We're actually mined the side of a mountain range, so to speak, and the Argyle deposit sits in here, and I'll show you a video a bit later. The discovery of Argyle, I'll show you another video in a minute, but ultimately it comes from what we call Smoke Creek and Limestone Creek, and you can see that Limestone Creek goes into this man-made structure called Lake Argyle, and so does Smoke Creek. So the next question should be, are there diamonds in Lake Argyle? And the answer is yes. 
is it economic to mine? Absolutely not. <laughs> and I doubt you're going to go and drain Lake Argyle to get a few handful of stones. So it's not going to happen. Where did the Ord River go before Lake Argyle was created? Down the Ord River, through to Kununurra, through to Wyndham, and out to the Cambridge Gulf. So even back in the boom times, or just before the GSC, some of you may even remember the Cambridge Gulf diamonds, and they were out there with dredges trying to dredge stuff away and, and pick that stuff up. I think uh, from what I've gathered and learnt, um, basically lucky to get one stone, and that may have been a, a laboratory accident anyway. So effectively, it doesn't mean it wasn't worthwhile. The logic is there. But it just means has the have the diamonds remained there and are they trackable or can you actually go and find something economic downstream? There are diamondiferous areas down in there, so it's not untenable. But it really comes down to the economics. In what volume of rock are you going to get certain certain diamonds? Um, right. Let's go to. I do a talk about the discovery, but we're not going to have time today. So I'm just going to show you a video as if it was day one. This was 1979 in um, the 1st of October, I think. So we're coming down from Lake Argyle and we're going back down from Lake Argyle down to Smoke Creek in here. Obviously back then they didn't have an airport, uh, but that's the, that's the current topography and that's the 1979 topography that we're going through here. So people like Frank Hugh, Warren Atkinson and Maureen Muggeridge basically found the first sample right about here, uh, actually here and then followed up samples here and down in here. So they literally would have been traversing down Smoke Creek. And we're not gonna go back to the original history because it goes for about 10 years, but we'll just cover the today that they found the deposit and they're tracking that down. Frank and Warren particularly walked down Smoke Creek, panning and digging the diamonds all the way down here till they got around the back of North Hill. That's our current Gap Dam that didn't exist back at the time. And at the time, Frank thought the top of these ranges in here called the Ragged Range conglomerates. They're a Devonian conglomerate, similar to Bungle Bungles, actually, sitting on top of it. So they just thought it was probably diamonds shedding off of them. But every time they jigged and sampled down the creek, they'd get more and more diamonds. To the point where when they turned around North Hill here, they had what they called a jewel box. And they were getting about four carats a ton of four millimeter diamonds sitting in here, right there. They then walked onto the pipe. And as the story goes, and I can absolutely confirm this, they actually saw something glistening in an anthill, um, which I think I've got a picture of later on. Um, and basically that was a diamond in the anthill. So, diamond, so termites are sampling material subsurface and they bring that up to form the anthill, the termite. In fact, people like Dave Jones, for those who remember Dave a long time ago, passed away a long time ago, but he worked with Kimberley Diamonds with Miles Kennedy and Carl Simic. He used to use bashing termites and sampling termite mounds and sampling those up as a regular tool back in Ellen Day. So we've come up to the top of the pipe, Razor Ridge is sitting here. The, the diamond pipe actually would have dripped over the range and poured diamonds over here. We're now stopped and you can now see all the alluvial deposits that have shed off Argyle. So Argyle pipe sat in here, but it shed diamonds down Smoke Creek and then around the corner to Gap Creek in here and then Limestone Creek where they combine to be limestone and heads off to Lake Argyle and Lake Argyle. You see the three different colours. These are different terraces of diamonds. A terrace, B terrace, and C terrace. So effectively, these are paleo channels. A terrace was the original flow of the river, which came through here. That was then cross-cut later on in life with the B terrace, which are the greens, and then most of the deposits which we mine from um, to, uh, mid or early 80s to uh, 2002 were the C terrace. We jokingly say, but it's real, we've got the most expensive airport in the world because it is built on diamonds, okay? That's never been mined. And you go, my gosh, let's go and mine it. So the problem is they sample that, and then a bright geologist at the time said, I don't think those samples were correct to resample them, you got about a fifth of the grade. And we actually developed a tailings dam down here to mine that, and luckily he resampled that properly. There was a lab error. There was diamonds caught up in the lab, and effectively they got um, wrong sample grade because of that. And this comes down to the old releases, which were released in the like dark -like. So that's a pretty good view of what Argyle looks like and what they would have done on day one effectively. <coughs> How did Argyle form? And the best analogy is a place called Surtsey. Surtsey's off the southern coast of Iceland. So if I just zoom out for the moment, let's go around the world. Let's go and find, listen up here. And off the southern coast around about here is a little island that was born in the ocean. I think it's there called Surtsey. 
And Surtsey effectively is in a shallow marine environment. So most of us from Perth, imagine you're a potter slow, a couple of k's off the potter slow, suddenly these things erupt, okay? And as it erupts, you're getting a phreatomagmatic eruption. Phreato, meaning water, magmatic, meaning magma. So if you put a hot pot of oil on, you, on your stove and put a bit of water in, guess what's going to happen? Bam. Okay, that's what happens here with a phreatomagmatic eruption. So they're extraordinarily violent. So really what it's doing is erupting through loose deltaic sands, and it's also erupting through 1.8 to 1.2 billion years. So remember the eruptions at 1.2, but the sands forming at 1.2. So we've got sandstone, and when I say sandstone, imagine you grab a GFP, drag it heavily down a wall, and you get sand rain flying off. Okay, not quartzite, not ding, this is going to be a thud. It's going to be semi-consolidated, but you've got sand grains which can be liberated with an explosion. You've also probably got loose sand which is sitting on the top, and that is literally just pouring into the bucket blocks. So let's go and have a look at what that would most likely look like. 1963, Surtsey starts to erupt. Someone goes up in their plane and says, oh, this looks good. I'll go and take a video of that. And effectively, it's starting to form an island. So when we're... When we're modeling iron ore deposits, when we're modeling mineral sand deposits, we're looking at these layers and we're connecting one drill hole to another, we're trying to bloody model this. Okay. So these eruptions, which some of them are sitting up there, or all of them sitting up there, um, is the probably the original eruption. Now, this really was, was well understood, but it wasn't well understood with respect to internal geology. We'll get onto that a bit later. 1964, a year later, it takes off, and lo and behold, there's Suti. Okay, it's about, it's a very analogous to Ariel. It's about the right length, a couple of pages of length, and they've got a bubbling lava lake sitting at the top there. That's equivalent to our non sandy. So we have sandy lamprite, which just means, as I said, sand's pouring into the lamprite and mixing with it. So effectively, you're getting a beautiful, like a kimberlite deposit, but it's just lamprite. Difference between lamprite and kimberlite, think of, there's many different debates on this, but the reality is it's the same sort of stock, but the lamprite. A kimberlite will have the consistency of olive oil when it rubs. Lamprite will be that maple syrup. Okay? Nothing like Hawaii, like a gooey, sticky magma. They're both running, they're both volatile, they're both explosive, but they'll give slightly different chemistry, different mineralogy, maybe erupt, erupt a little differently, but they're still both violent. And chances are, in this case, most people associate lamprites with champagne glass style wine. That's actually not correct. It just happens to be that the country rock that a kimberlite or a lamplite erupts through, if it's hard, it'll give you a carrot shaped pipe. If it's soft and full of sand or an Allendale full of sandy style material, guess what? It's not going to give you a carrot shaped pipe that's going to blow out. The question becomes is lamplite powerful enough to blast through something like the Kariba salt in Botswana, for instance, and give you a lamplite pipe or whether it will blow it? So Argyle is basically a, a Lamprite deposit that is contaminated heavily with beach sand and sandstone. So our lamprite can range from 99.9% .9 sand through to 20% sand. But generally speaking, most of the deposits are about 50, 60, 70% sand. And we've got the highest grade in the world by orders of magnitude. So imagine if we didn't have that dilution. And we've got parts of the deposit that, that don't have that dilution. So back in the 70s, in the 60s, actually, or actually, let's talk about it. So where did, where did the search for Argyle come from? Ultimately, back in 1920s, 1930s, Rex Pryder, who's a, a professor at the University of WA, came up with a theory that the Kimberlites that were forming in the coincidentally named Kimberley in South Africa looked like it basically had a similar style of the recently discovered in 1910-1920 lucite lamprites that were discovered in the West Kimberley around Allendale. So they found these lucite lamprite pipes and went, wow, that sort of looks like that stuff in the Kimberley in South Africa. Maybe there's something to it. So he wrote a few papers on that. And then a student of his called Ewan Tyler um, basically took that on and after well, 19... Uh, so he went through as a student in 1930, 1940, and by the time he came out, he formed a company, Tanganyika Holdings, got a whole lot of people interested in, and eventually got CRA interested when in the entry of Rio, um, and basically tried to go and prove that theory by Rex Pyle. Ultimately, they discovered the first pipes in the top of Western Australia, the Terrapus Pipe, um, right near Kaimbaru, 
and that was uh, about the early 70s, 72, 73. Found a couple more, headed down to Allendale. They discovered a whole lot more pipes, found E4 and E9, which was what Kimberly Diamond's mine. And then ultimately they headed off to the east because they found a, a trace in a place called Maud Creek for the uh, for a Kimberlite dike. And then eventually they stumbled onto the sampling at Smoke Creek. The interesting thing about the story, because again, the beers thought this is the only significant thing. Lamprites are insignificant. Who cares about them? They'd actually sampled the area. And the interesting part is if Rio, or back then CRA, knew that the beers had sampled the area, this wouldn't have happened. This program wouldn't have happened. Chances are they'll never be a But when they started this program and they went to the East Kimberleys, they saw these chocolate skin marks on the ground. So De Beers had actually gone through a sample of this place before that, but talking to a lot of De Beers people internally, particularly in South Africa, I know that they thought this was a very low priority target. Let's just go and sample it, put it in a warehouse, and one year we'll go, we'll go and have a look at it. Rio, back then CRA, had a far better program whereby they could take samples, send it straight to the lab, get information back from the lab, and then feed their program live as they were doing it. That's actually why Argo was discovered by us, or by CRA, I should say, um, before anyone else did, because of the sampling program, the way that they did it. But back then, Kimberlite was the major thing to look for. So this is going to look different to the sandy lamp light you're going to see over there. And effectively, this is just material with mantle load, mantle material that has been brought up. So I've got olivines and garnets and ilmenites, whatever sitting over there, and they're the indicator materials that we look for with diamonds. Why? Because when you look at this, say a shot that I took at the Rafa, you can see bucket loads of garnets in here and here and ilmenites and olivines. And our Falcon project in Saskatchewan, this literally is raining out olivine grains like marbles. So these are all olivine, olivine, olivine. You see these red garnets sitting in here and these steely looking ilmenites. It literally would look like someone has just dumped a truckload of olivines and material sitting in their beds. That's what people looked for back in the 70s, particularly. Why? Because South Africa, Botswana, Rafa, Joanine, et cetera, um, were discovering those sorts of deposits. So why are they looking for those materials? If you look at um, John Gurney, who's just passed away, unfortunately, pretty much a, is the grandfather of a lot of mantle geochemistry. Basically, here's some of his collection that he had in Botswana. And you see all these olivines and these garnets, and in this case, chrome oxides and garnets. If you take a slab and put a light behind them, it looks even more impressive. So you can start to see this is the material that we're looking for, these purpley red garnets, the deep end garnets. They are, wow, we're in the right postcode here. It's like we're in Heppner Grove right here. Okay, and anything like that that gives you the chemistry. But remember, these nodules which survive and been brought up from the mantle have been disaggregated. So you don't normally see this. If you're lucky if you saw a preserved nodule, you're just going to see fragments of this brought up and deposited with either kimberlite or, in our case, lamprite. And that's what we're trying to find. So uh, that's actually a diamond from Karoi in Botswana. That went for about $63 million. So we don't have them in Argo, but uh, that would be nice to get. Okay, so originally in the, in the discovery when they walked on the lamp, uh, walked, up, walked on the lamp right on the outcrop, and they mapped out the outcrop, it was thought to be some sort of long elongate dike. Okay, so here's a lamp right. Well, it's an elongate dike. It's just a crack in the ground and things have come up. And then they started to drill it out more and more, which we won't go into tonight, but ultimately things changed. So over many decades and a lot of drilling, it wasn't just a big flat elongate dike. It was a multi-load uh, lamp right pipe with diatremes that headed down in multiple places in here. Historically, we had five domains, and these domains were difficult to tell apart except for grade and microdiamond distribution. So back in old days, in the very early, there were some really smart geologists who said, I'm going to go and try and do the typical fence diagram of a sedimentary deposit. Here's, you know, <laughs> uh, sandstone A, here's sandstone A, here's sandstone A. Let's connect them up between three drill holes and we'll draw a line and we'll put it on a piece of paper. And then we'll try and volumetrically create a model out of that and see how many diamonds we've got. Okay, so really sedimentary style deposit. I showed you what a volcano looks like, and you don't really get that connection. So they played that game for about six months and tried to play join the dots with all the holes for the first 150 meters, threw their hands up in the air, said, This is really difficult. And you'll see why in a minute, and you can see why in the rocks over there a bit later. So then, unfortunately, here's a lesson learned um, the mine then became an engineering based deposit. In other words, well, the geologists can't put this pull this apart, so let's mine the grey and throw away the red. Grey being the lamp right, the red being all the waste rocks. 
And effectively, for the next 20, 30 years, it was wherever there's grain, there's land right, mine it, it'll be fine, it's all about coal, throw away that red stuff. Okay? And that works really well when you generate a pit that slices all the way along here, because you get a bit of this and 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 a bit of this. So we believe we reconciled really well over a number of years. When I first joined in 2003, no one could explain to me why one month is 140% reconciliation, the next month is 70. Oh, that's just diamonds. Um, it's like, hmm, interesting. So we lived with that because on an annual basis, it will balance out. It's not a good way to run, but that's the way we ran, and it worked for decades. Then we went, put this bloody thing in here with the block holes, <coughs> okay? And that would work out well if we believe all this grey stuff called the South Sandy Low is everything in the block cave, which the geologists in the past who looked at the grey of these and looked at the distributions of diamonds said, this looks exactly the same as that. So ipso facto, it's all good. We're the same. Let's start to run off of that. Distributions of grey in the pipe. So we had phenomenal grades thing up here. So for those, a few of you in the diamond industry, you'll probably have even talked to me tonight, said carrots per 100 tonne. We deal with carrots per tonne. So times your stuff, you know, you've got 100 times the volume. A tonne of rock at Argyle is 0.7 by 0.7 by 0.7 metres. So now imagine you've got 10 plus carrots per tonne in that cubic volume. And that's not 10 one carat diamonds, by the way, because <laughs> that would be fantastic. You'd be lucky to have a carrot diamond in there. But you'll have and maybe a few half carat diamonds, and you maybe have quite a number of 0.1 carat diamonds, and eventually down to the scale where you might have thousands of bug dust style diamonds, okay? 0.1, 0.2 mil. Theoretically, the thing should be glistening. You never bloody see a diamond. So ultimately, this is filthy, absolutely filthy with diamonds. This best grade that I um, saw in our deposit was 66 carat per ton in the, in the southern tail. So that's just, that's just unbelievable. That's like having a um, 20,000 gram per tonne gold deposit. Okay, it's so ridiculous. And then we had lower grades in here. Okay, and the block cave was going to pretty much mine an average grade sitting in there. However, when you look at Argo, remember I said that the uh, earth, well, actually, there's someone downstairs, the earth had tilted and part of Argo eroded. So when, when by the time they got there, um, after, erode, uh, after erupting at 1.2 billion years, if you reconstruct the Earth, so if we tilt it up 30 degrees and all the stratigraphic units sitting there are now flat, that's what Argo would have looked like if you reconstruct it. So in other words, the stuff at the south is actually really deep in the diatribe. Okay, So all of that has gone. We had 1.25 billion recoverable carrots from day one. We probably already lost one and a quarter billion as well. So it might have been two and a half billion carrots if that wasn't eroded. So we got there quick enough, but not quick enough. <laughs> So half of it's gone, and that's the problem with Argo, is that down here, the further you go to the south, you're getting deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into the system, whereby you're going to get a feeder dike, which is probably going to be about one metre wide. And that's about the general consensus of the dike that forms a Kimberley or a Lamplight pipe. And actually, if you actually go five kilometres to the south, we have some deposits called the Lissadel Road dikes. And guess what? They're about a metre wide, and guess what? They're diamondiferous, and guess what? They're similar diamonds to Argo. So there could have been more Argos, but they've gone eroded away a long, long time ago. But to the north, yeah, there might be some potential, but then you've got the materials that haven't been eroded off. So there might be under hundreds of metres, if not kilometres of sediments sitting out there. So Argos in this really weird window of you know, the big fella decided to go and tilt the earth, shave it off, and took half away, and it's exposed. And why can't we find anything else? Because in most diamondiferous deposits, you're going to find clusters. Argo, you don't, you find one. So is that just be, everything was tapped or those Lissadel Road deposits might've been another Argo or is there something hidden? But it's on an on a, a area whereby it's been exposed in a very awkward position. We know we're towards the top of the crater at the top here because when they got in there in the 80s, they mapped lake crater sediments. So lake crater sediments just means the volcano goes off, the volcano finishes, usually you get a crater inside the volcano, fills with rain, fills with water, and you get sediment, shales forming in that crater, and they form sediments themselves. That's what was mapped in the 80s. So they know that we're probably close to the crater up here, might be a bit further up, but we know we're deep in the system in here. So it's not that easy though, because when they looked at it and said, oh, it's an elongate dike, or maybe even if it's not an elongate dike, it's really quite simplistic in the, um, in the overall shape. But this is my, oh my God, plus one day, Whereby in 2004, sorry, 2004, um, the beginning of four, I was 
constructing, well, actually, in 2003, my first role was to go and find a unit like this, big, big, chunky quartzite, so we could go and mine underground. We want to put a decline in this stuff and all this crap. So modeled all the stuff underground, came back and modeled all the rest of the pit because there wasn't a waste rock model for the pit, and I could not connect <coughs> the dots in here. Got to remember that for the year, this was covered in real, so you could not see any of that face, and I had pretty poor data or mapping um, uh, that I could go and use. So when they finally cleared all the real, and then we had a massive thunderstorm and it washed all the pit, the day before, suddenly this was exposed. The next morning, I got up and took these photos. And what you're seeing here is what I call the, the sawtooth. So basically, Argyle, the side of Argyle, has been sawtooth or offset by a series of jogs and structures. So this is this sawtooth in here. So there's the lamprite. And the interesting thing about this, you can see a hot contact. So in here, that's what's cooked up the country rock as it's been intruded 1.2 billion years ago. This is a cold contact. This happened hundreds of millions of years after that when the deposit was just like, imagine putting dominoes on a table. Then you push the first domino, tink, 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 tink. This is the gap between those dominoes when you push them. So effectively, we have shunted the deposit like a series of dominoes afterwards. Okay, And that happens all the way up the ore body. So instead of being this elongate dike, it didn't actually form like that. It was later stretched out due to structure. Okay, so when you start to look at that structure, this is quite interesting. Inside the pit itself, this is what we call the infamous soil zone. All this stuff, that's not blasted rock. First, you look at it and think, oh, okay, you show me a blast, big deal. This is actually a five or 10 meters behind the blast. And this material, you can probably see that slip inside a wall. As we open up that blast and dug it away, this literally just collapsed in a rubble mess. So those faults that went through the ore body and into the wall rocks, were basically represented by this in 2004 here, photo I took, say that that material was basically rubble. And yes, there are structures which weren't understood before that. This is a close up of that. So you can even see the slip inside on here. Again, remember, we're five or 10 meters into the wall from the blast. So this material is just a mess. And if you look at that in core, that's what it looks like, okay, and worse. So effectively trying to drill at Argyle is a big challenge, particularly drilling on the ground. So we had to deal with that, especially with the underground, and that was a bit of an eye opener. And there's a beautiful slip inside the surface, one of those gap fault steps that passed through the ore body in 2004. So ultimately, it looked like this when you're looking at it, instead of being an elongate dike, it really was shunted like a series of dominoes, shunted across, and the, what we call the northern bowl here was probably back here somewhere. Okay, and it's been dragged out. Now that has implications because if you believe all that's the same, well, who cares? It's just offset structure. We can mine the whole lot, doesn't matter. We just worry about the contact. But what if there was grade distribution differences in that deposit and have they been shunted and how are you going to estimate that? Especially if something which was connected is now sitting up here. So case in point, right at the top here, for instance, they actually chose a point, it's a bit hard to see here, but it's what we call the neck. It's where that, that uh, diatrium came up and then the next guy trend came. So they basically made an arbitrary point for many years and said, stuff to the north of that will call one domain, stuff to the south of that will call one domain. But really, all this good stuff to the south was actually dragged all the way up here. So when we discovered, when I discovered that and said, um, you know, I think we're doing the estimation incorrectly. And now we're taking these samples and estimating it all the way up there and not allowing the low grades to contaminate that. Overnight, the pit shifted 50 metres across to the east literally 50 metres across. So instead of mining this stuff out here, it said, wow, there's good stuff here, let's go and reshift. It didn't cause a problem because we're in the middle of, of developing it, but instead of mining out there, the next cut takes we're heading down this way. Um, so these are just some of the, the major faults. These are not all the faults. This is probably the best analogy. This is my brother-in-law's ceiling at a Christmas lunch about a decade ago. And he was building a mezzanine. So mezzanine's like an open second floor. And his mezzanine was moving from the rest of the house. So effectively, it was being wrenched. It's causing a relational job. So despite people thinking I was totally um, under the influence, standing up on the chair taking photos of the ceiling, I said, this is the best analogy for Argyle I've ever seen. So effectively, <laughs> Argyle is a series of tear faults, this little wrench system, which basically has dragged out a deposit. Let's go and have a look at what Argyle looks like today from underground mining. 
Sorry, let's come back. Okay, so we're going to fly into the deposit. So this region here, there's our processing facility. When you go underground, there's our waste dumps. The ore body will be in green, the block cave will be in red, and there's our declines coming down. So ultimately, we brought up material by the conveyor decline, and we also accessed the deposit by um, the other decline. So there's our ore body in green, as I said, block cave in red, and there's our pit that we mined the block cave from. For those who haven't dealt with block caves before, imagine you go down to the beach with your kids, you dig a really big hole with your hand, you think you're really clever, and you get down to about half a metre or so, and you dig this big hole and you think, great kids, look at that. And then suddenly the, bottom, the stuff at the bottom collapses because it's a bit wet and got to the water table. So you dig that out again, you think, I'll oh, fix that. And then a bit more collapses and you dig that out and a bit more collapses. Well, that's how block cave works. So ultimately we dig to this point in the blue, which is what we call the undercut. We then drill one series of um, rounds of explosions, you want to call that, to drag that material above that. And it's like a Goldilocks zone. Don't want your material to be so weak that it collapses because then you won't be able to keep up all that infrastructure on the ground. You don't want it to be too strong because when you blast it up, it's sitting there waiting for it to collapse and it won't. So you've got to have a rock type that's broken up enough and not too much. And ultimately, when we tickle it, so when we um, let off a few rounds above the blue, what we call the undercut, that collapses into the yellow zone, which is what we call the extraction level. We bolt out of that extraction level. And effectively, that material keeps collapsing upwards and upwards and upwards and upwards, and eventually it gets to the surface. Okay? And our surface, in this case, was the pit. So when it gets to the pit, all that crap in the pit, which is waste rocks, will start breaking up and then going into the cave, which can be problematic because if you don't pull your cave very well, you can get lots of waste coming in where you don't want it to come in. So block cave management is its own art um, rather than just stoke mining. So if we go back to say 2014, another lesson learned. Remember I told you that there was, it was a neon gate night and then I said there was about five zones and that was okay because we can deal with that. But then when we started the block cave, suddenly within a few month period of opening up the block cave, truly in 2013 and taking the first big sample, we had less of these diamonds and more of these diamonds. We still had all the diamonds, but proportionally less and more. So. I'm pretty sure if I said you want to go and buy a ring down at Samuels or somewhere like that, or down at, uh, down at Solid Gold, which one you prefer is probably this one. So this is going to be a higher price diamond than that. This is full of inclusions and darker. Okay. So that's straight off the bottom line. That's like saying we've got less high, high value diamonds and more lesser value diamonds. So that comes straight off the bottom line. We lost quite a few percent almost overnight, and that continued on for another quarter or two, and it kept going down. As you can imagine, People were quite worried. Um, so that led into uh, the Russians coming in at night time and injecting inclusions into our diamonds underground. And the answer was probably no. So was it a process developed thing whereby they are doing something and crushing diamonds in the plant? No. Um, and then when we talked to Antwerp with our diamond sorters, the first sentence they said, well, we're seeing a lot more dark inclusions inside the diamond. Uh -huh. Well, that probably is not a, a person-made process. That is probably a natural process. So it came back to geology. Okay. So this is, oh, shit, I've had enough. And so, oh, I forgot to apologise. This is my COVID beard from February last year. So that, believe it or not, isn't how it normally looks. So I'm just not lazy for the last two years. Um, we'll come up one day. So enough is enough. Now, when you start with a block cave, you can't drill a block cave. Why? Because the rocks are moving. So it's irrelevant. So the next best thing you do is go and grab a boulder from underground and drop off a few tons of rocks for you. And unfortunately, this was in December, so 42, 45 degrees. Wetting the rocks and wetting me, then wetting the rocks and wetting me. And within half an hour, sorry, within four hours, that's what I saw. And ultimately, you're going to see the iconic argyle, which is the bed of the lamprite. Remember I said sand was pouring in? And it's not necessarily forming beds when it's pouring in, but that's another story. And then, however, we saw this one, which was recognised in the 80s. They called that ragged lamp right? So I recycled that. And they were trying to connect these things to each other and connect these things to each other. Remember those fence diagrams I said to play join the dots? Didn't work. But I also saw this one. And I saw, more importantly, this one. So what the hell did that mean? What's good? What's bad? Does it really care? Who, who, does it make a difference? So then I went on a mission and get to know your rocks is the biggest thing. So go and start to cut a lot of them, which is where that came from. And don't just cut them, go and actually look at what's inside of them. And we consulted to a fellow who we've been working with for a number of years at Thunder and Diving. 
and uh, and whatnot, a great um, petrographist and also a great Kimberlite geologist, Stephen Moss. And so this is us pouring through the, the slides and suddenly it all made sense and that we had this iconic bedded lamprite, which is what Argyle is known for. You ever see a piece of lamprite, Argyle? That's it. So this is a series of beds. How did the beds form? So our theory, or sorry, probably Volker Lorenz's theory back in the 70s and 80s, and we still stick by this, the free atomatic deposits, is if you go back to, say, um, uh, Manhattan Experiment, nuclear bombs, okay? Germans are coming, we've got to stop them, Japanese are coming, et cetera. So let's go and, let's go and invent the nuclear bomb. When they did the experience in New Mexico, they let the first bombs off. You generally see three things, okay? The first thing is like the Hollywood movies, well, actually not Hollywood movies, you see a shockwave coming in. Okay, that's instantaneous. The second thing, like in the Terminator and the Hollywood movies, you see this wall of hell coming at you. That's called the base surge. Okay? And the third thing, which everyone knows about with a bomb, and they say straight away, if you ask them what happened to the nuclear bomb, is a mushroom core. These are the base surges. So the base surges actually were termed off of those Manhattan experiments, which is a sideways movement of the crack forming once a bomb goes off. And a volcano effectively is a bomb. So when the volcano is erupting, it's shooting this stuff start sideways like bedded sand dunes, okay? And this material is actually taking lamprite pyroclasts, which are these darker bits, and the lighter bits are basically beach sand or sandstone, which have been disaggregated. So it's actually shooting these out sideways in the crater and forming bedded deposits. Now, those bedded deposits, remember I said before, they can range between 30 to 80% of quartz content. That is effectively straight dilution. <laughs> So if you have 90% quartz, guess what's going to happen to your grade? If you have 10% quartz, guess what's going to happen to your grade? Okay. So in high grade, depending on how much quartz is in there, they have all these beautiful beds of lamprite pyroclast and then another bed. These will be potentially separate base surges, by the way. So don't think of this as, killer, uh, as, um, as, as a massive eruption, a Plinian eruption going off. The first eruption I got might have been. But all of these are like poof, 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 small little eruptions. There could be tens of thousands of them. And this may represent one eruption, which lasted for one minute. And a day later, this may be the next eruption. It could be a laha, it could be something else. So this is not a one size fits all eruption. You go and have a now look at the, the, the uh, macro scale, look at the meso scale. And there's a lamprite pyroclast, okay? Or if you're in the beers terminology in Canada, a magma class. Okay, but lamprite pyroclast and your juvenile lamprite pyroclast, there's a big stonking olivine sitting inside the magma. So as the magma is erupting up, it's got debris from the mantle, mantle log. So remember I showed you olivines and I showed you garnets and showed you chrome oxides. It's bringing these up and attracting them inside the lamprite pyroclast. But also remember that I told you that it's diluted, so all this grey stuff effectively is this mash and stuff like that there, but basically it's diluted by quartz. When you have a look at it at the micro scale, then there's the lamprite pyroclast. Here's your stomping great olivines, and here's your quartz in blues and yellows. I've coloured it so you can see it a bit easier. Um, surrounding that, so it's dilution. Interestingly, if uh, when you go into the theory of dim lights, um, usually there's about 50% maximum low that you can get within a, a, a magma coming up of any kimberlite or lamprite. If you have more, it's going to block. It can have less though. But ultimately, you can have olivines growing as it's on the way up. That's a small one, most likely. And you can have olivines directly from the mantle. So just because they're small doesn't mean they're shattered from this. Then we had this one, lamprite 1H, H meaning high growth. This is, a, again, a bedded sample. But look at the fact that it's now almost full of the darker lamprite pyroclast, which is some great samples over there. Bugger all grey quartz still looking in between. So in here, think of a bag of sultanas, bag of raisins when I talk to Canada and the US, and a bag of sultanas, and you put just a teaspoon of flour in, shake it up. And in this case, the teaspoon of flour is just coating all the sultanas, okay? That's what the honey pot would look like. In the previous sample, that is like taking a bag full of sultanas and putting four cups of flour in and shaking it up, okay? So lots of dilution in between there. So here we have lots of, this sample was uh, polished for us, um, polished for us by Vancouver um, Photography, and he was really upset because uh, you can see there, see all these scratches? You can see that going up and down here. He polished and polished and polished and polished and he couldn't get the scratches off and he thought I'd be really angry. 
And I said, you've, how many samples have you got? Like, he said, quite a few. I said, show me which ones they are. Sure enough, they're these high grade ones. So what had happened, he was polishing them so much, and this is so high grade, all the micro diamonds, which are bug dust, was being liberated out of rock and scratching the rock as he was trying to polish it. So no matter what he could do, so that's a great analogy, but, but the reality is that it's just filthy grade. So that's probably 50 carats a ton. Um, so this is really a class of water, what I affectionately call the honeypot, because it is the honeypot. Um, basically, there's all these lamprite pyrocases like the sultanas. The sultanas in the bag, they're sitting up and they're class supported against each other and the big stonking olivines. Okay. And again, if you look at that micro scale, the odd bit of quartz, but apart from that, it's magma, magma class or lamprite pyroclase and olivine and any other indicator mineral. Then we have this beast, which was called the ragged. So I recycled the name because I recognize they, at least they recognized it back then. Interestingly, they had never worked out where all the mudstones and shales had gone into the pit. They could say, hey, there's lots of sand, but where's the mudstone? Oh, I probably got disintegrated the bug dust and it's in the matrix, don't worry about it. Then we were, when I started to look at that, ubiquitously, whenever I got a piece of this ragged lamp right, lamp two, where I could always find relic mudstone in the lamp right. Okay? So this probably tells me that it's the first eruption because it's the only time that they survived. So basically when the first eruption of Argyle, that was like the Surtsey video, that was the big one, okay? It ripped up big chunks and they actually, the mudstone survived at that point. But go and have a look at the lamprite pyroclase. The lamprite pyroclase are this, and this is dark black stuff. So when I quiz the engineers, I said, what's the dark black stuff? And they say, oh, it has to be basalt, because basalt's black. But if you actually have a look at that dark black stuff, ultimately it's just quartz. Okay, so this is like pouring Cottesloe Beach into that first eruption. So this is not just this is a combination of disaggregated sandstone from the wall rocks, Cottesloe Beach pouring in, and then all of this stuff is sand, and these are the lamprite pyroclase. You go, well, that sort of doesn't look like the other stuff, that's more equal form. That's because these have been frozen in time. So these are almost like atoll structures. So these have been quenched in wet sediments, and before they can even equilibrate, they freeze. And so basically, here's the lamprite, here's some polyvines in the lamprite, but look at the amount of quartz sitting around that. So what do you think the grade's going to be in that? Pretty ugly, low, okay? And if we go to the micro scale, that's the story. Have a look at the quartz. That's your one lamprite pyroclase. Have a look at that lamprite pyroclase, by the way. What's the colour? Black. Why is it black? Because no matter how far you zoom in, it's aphanitic. In other words, it's so fine grained, it's frozen, it's glass, it's volcanic glass. So it doesn't actually have time to equilibrate. So to me, it's another piece of evidence saying first eruption, lots of quartz, ragged lamp right because it quenched the textures in there um, for the fine scale here as well, and probably low grade. Doesn't actually mean it absolutely is low grade, but you could have diamonds sprinkled around in here, but the chances of that being high grade are very, very low. And when we sampled afterwards, sure enough, it proved it was quite low grade. In, <laughs> Low grade by our standards, probably high grade by anyone else, a carrot a ton. To us, that's, that's money. Um, so what did that actually mean? So when you take all of these and put it back together, I think what has happened is that we have an original eruption and imagine all of this was filled with a black, which in this case is lamp through the ragged lamp right. So the ragged lamp right has basically filled up this in a, in a plinian style eruption. It's very violent and it's full of that. And if that's all it was, and it was the last eruption, we wouldn't have mined Argyle. I don't know why that's banging. Unless it's me. Um, so we wouldn't have mined Argyle because it was basically just a carrot a ton and it wouldn't be worthwhile. Later on, then we've had units which are like these, these yellow bits are uh, this unit. I haven't talked about it, I won't tonight, but these are like temperature heads. Imagine you're getting a very small, I'm just going to shout, a very small um, unit that is trying to punch its way up through the ore body. And it doesn't have to eject everything out like a classic De Beers model. All it's doing is eroding its way through in a very small vent. And you often see that in volcanoes nowadays. You have a look at a volcano that's erupted, and when you see the next eruption, there's this piggly little five metre vent sitting somewhere. You might have a white smoker and a black smoker. And white might be steam, and the black actually might have material of magma coming out of it. So that's all these are. And the one that was the biggest that maybe eventually got through, in this case, was a honeypot. So when we mine, what we call the South Sandy High up here, really, it just connected to the feeder. Now, remember our block cave was down here. 
Okay, so ultimately, even though we mined all these sections across here, now, even though they thought they were just going to mine in grey, now it's grey with ridiculous high grades. You think, oh, that's really good. We're going to get all this high grade. That's actually not what happened. So that's a bit of a, another story. So unfortunately, because we found this out after we started mining the block cave, a lot of that really, really good grade was still lost. Okay, and we never got to it. And even the parts that we could get to it, remember that story I told you about the structure and all those faults? That means we actually closed 40% of our draw points and we concreted them up because we could not keep them open. So effectively, all the good stuff in there, we couldn't get to much of it. And all the other good stuff was sitting on the sidelines in the hanging room drive, unfortunately. So what did Argyle probably look like? If you drag this back to here, then quite, I wouldn't say coincidentally, is an, almost like a beautiful fit. I've just dragged this back into that. You can see that the Northern Bowl was probably just another lobe of argyle, it probably looked more like Victor. So in other words, it wasn't a carrot-shaped pipe because it's not going through something hard like a basalt, the crude basalt in Botswana. It is a bit more V-shaped because it's not in a hard country rock. It's a sandstone, but not a quartzite. So it's opened up a little bit. We've eroded, it's been eroded off over a long time. So it's significant depth, but it's probably looking in plan view had um, different temperature punching up and forming a honey pot, the high grade stuff over here. And then through here, we have what we call the non sand. Remember that bubbling lava lake at Surtsey? That didn't have sand next to it. That was a cross cutting event and only had lamprite pyroclasts, not sand. That's a piece of that orange rock went, or red rock when you see it over there. So that's probably what Argyle really would have looked like originally. Can't go away without showing you some of the product. So as you probably all know, uh, well, <laughs> My introduction to diamonds, not, not to diamonds, to Argyle in 2003, I'm um, in Kings Park Road. You probably remember two Kings Park Road, whatever you remember that then. And my boss, after the first week, said, You've got to understand the product. So go upstairs and go and look to the sorting thing and uh, find out about the diamonds. So, of course, being really keen, I went up there and said, Can I have a look at the champagne in the diamonds? We don't have champagne in the diamonds. Strange, but anyway, I thought you were Argyle done. Yeah. So I uh, started to look around and then went from the sorting machine to the, the sorting tables and so on, and eventually asked the same question. And eventually got into the place where they finally did the splits on the size and they had nappy buckets. And one nappy bucket had LB, and one had nappy bucket had B. I said, What are they? And they said, That's the light browns and browns. So the light browns and the champagne and the browns and the cognacs. So that was the massive marketing campaign in the 1990s <laughs> to give you all of the fancy colors of Argyle, which is actually fantastic. And it's, it's a brilliant piece of work. For those of you who have probably got a keen eye, you probably recognize this. So there's a pink, and it's probably about the right ratio. It's about one in, uh, we say one in a thousand, it's really about one in 770 stones is a pink diamond sitting in here. We have our whites, but there's a lot of you know, included diamonds. So I think they eventually came up with the name Silver Mist, which is a bit weird, <laughs> but effectively greyish diamonds um, sitting in there. So is it the highest value product in the world? No, excluding that. No. Um, compared to other deposits, which may have $100 a carat run of mine. Run of mine means it's like going to a grocery store, take your, your Granny Smiths, take your watermelons and take your truffles, add them all together per kilo and you'll get a number. That's called run of mine. Run of mine for a grocery shop. We have a run of mine for us. Some places around the world have very expensive run of mines, $100 a carat. Some have $1,000 a carat. But for those who have $100 a carat, generally you don't have that many diamonds. For those who have $1,000 a carat, may have one or two carats per hundred ton. So they're hoping that they're going to find the one or two Lamborghinis to pay the bills. We've mined lots of Toyota Corollas to pay the bills. But luckily, once in a while, we get a Lamborghini. Okay, so, and that's what helps pays our bills as well. So we have a bit of both from, from both sides. When we did that study, it was quite interesting. This is a thin section, okay? So even then, this petrographer was also cutting kind of thinnies for us. Couldn't work out why I couldn't get that part of the down. So he actually had a diamond in the thinny. Um, so that's unique. And of course, um, the iconic pink stone. So um, our last pink tender just happened a couple of months ago. Lucky enough to go and uh, bunch my way in there because I get to see all the pink stones in, in Perth when we had it. Um, so that's just a good example of those and, and what the pinks look like. I'm in there. And that is about right on time.